So imagine a person's walking down the street in front of the White House and walks up to the White House door seeking an audience with the President of the United States. Better yet, imagine that person is you. I mean, you're in fine form, your shoes are polished, your hair is combed, you're in your Sunday best, and you want an audience with the Commander-in-Chief because there's a few burning issues you'd like to discuss with him. Like maybe perhaps, you know, talking about the respect for the military, which doesn't seem to be happening with all the problems at the VA, or maybe you want to talk about your income taxes. Yours are way too high, while there are way too many people who have no skin in the game at all. Or then there might be that sticky matter of the enemy combatants at Guantanamo Bay, the worst of the worst. You don't want them on American soil, much less your home state of Kansas in Leavenworth. Couldn't the president just pick up the phone or the pen and take care of these issues? Not going to happen, is it? There are too many barriers between the president and you. The gates are locked. The guards won't let you in. The staff doesn't know your name. And the Secret Service are taught to shoot first and ask questions later. It wouldn't be a good idea to try and jump the fence to see the president. It's kind of fun to fantasize about these things, to fantasize about sharing your hope and your heart with the president, but it's just not going to happen. I mean, let's face it. We little guys don't have enough money to buy access. We don't have enough political clout to merit access. We don't have the right connections with the right people at the right time to gain access. If only we could get access. But what if? What if you did? What if the president looks out the window on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and sees you shuffling along the sidewalks? And what if he tells his security detail, go get that person and bring them in? And what if he sits down and attentively listens to all your concerns? That would be great, right? It's not going to happen. Not with the president of the United States. But, but it can with the king of the universe. <laughs> you have a friend in high places. In our continued series from Isaiah 56 to 66, we're going to look at that section right after our text from last week's message. You know, last week's message and text were was really harsh in tone and graphic in detail, telling us how God would destroy the idolaters, but yet provide a place in his heart for refuge for those who trust in him. Today's text continues on, the next seven verses from that text. It's in page 734 if you got one of the Bibles in back and are bringing it with you and, and looking it up. We're going to look specifically at verse 15. Because in this text, which is more conciliatory, more inviting, and more encouraging, God says that he wants to provide unlimited access to the nations for those who are contrite in their heart. I mean, look at the title that NIV puts over this section, Comfort for the Contrite. So verse 15, the first part, A, it says... For this is what the high and lofty one, it really it's, the word is not holy there in the original Hebrew, it's lofty. He says, he who dwells in eternity, whose name is Kadosh, holy. I live in a high and holy place. Normally the Old Testament tells us that Yahweh dwells in the tabernacle or dwells in Solomon's temple, or on the Temple Mount, Mount Zion, or in the holy city of Jerusalem. The emphasis of the Old Testament is that the creator of this universe wants to have a relationship with his people, and so he comes down to dwell with us. 
But Isaiah, in our text today especially, and, and in most of his prof prophetic work there, tells us that Yahweh is also the Holy Other. He is far, far away from this planet Earth and dwells in eternity. Isaiah says that Yahweh is the absolute, the infinite, the eternal, the all-powerful one, the all-knowing one, the one and only true God. He says that Yahweh is inscrutable and untouchable, totally unapproachable by sinful humanity. In chapter 40, it tells us that um, God there, that would, it, it describes Yahweh as sitting above the circle of the earth and looking down upon us. And when he sees us, he sees us like grasshoppers. Also in verse 40, he says that the nations of this planet are like a drop in the bucket or as dust on the scale. The seraphim in chapter 6 of Isaiah gather around the, the throne and continually cry out before him, Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. No wonder then Isaiah describes Yahweh as having the most holy name, living in the most holy place. He is unique, different, separate, completely removed. Sixty-nine times in his prophetic book he uses the word holy. Nineteen times he calls Yahweh Kadosh Israel, the Holy One of Israel. There are massive barriers between us and God. The gates are locked. The hosts of heaven keep you out. No unclean or sinful human being dare draw near to the Holy One of Israel. And yet, in the very next consecutive clause, Isaiah goes on to say that this high and holy one comes near with him who is crushed and lowly in spirit. I know the NIV uses the word contrite there, but that's kind of a, a translation already. The Hebrew word daka really means crushed. As in Isaiah 53, he was crushed for our iniquities. In this section then, Isaiah says that those who are crushed and humble in spirit, that this high and lofty one will draw near to them. And when we hear that as arrogant and sinful human beings, we may think to ourselves, hey, you know, if I just become crushed and humbled enough, maybe I can have unlimited access to Yahweh. Ha, good luck with that. That has about as much chance as happening as seeing the President of the United States. I mean, from little on, we're taught this self-esteem and this victimization stuff. There's no way we humans are going to humble and crush ourselves enough to be before the one true God. In fact, we're intoxicated with quite the opposite. You and I according to scripture and probably in real life, if we're honest, are drunk on pride. Isaiah chapter 2 says that God, Yahweh, is against all forms of pride. He is against all that is exalted, against the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, against the oaks of Bashan, against the towering mountains and the, all the high hills, against every lofty tower and every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish and every stately vessel. 
Two times in this same poem, it says that Yahweh alone will be lifted up on that day. The high and lofty one tolerates no rivals. No one else is allowed to sit on his throne. The book of Isaiah lists those who in pride question the Lord like King Ahaz in chapter 7 when he says, I will not ask the Lord. Or Sargon II in chapter 14 when he says, I'll be like the Holy One. Or Sennacherib, king of Assyria in chapter 36, when he taunts the people of Jerusalem by saying, don't listen to Hezekiah and have him persuade you to trust Yahweh. Pope Gregory the Great, long before the papacy became corrupt, said that pride is the mother of all sins. Medieval artists depict pride as a peacock arrogantly strutting her stuff. Milton in Paradise Lost portrayed pride with these damning words. Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And then Luther's dictum. Omni peccatum est suburbia. All sin is pride. Pride refuses to utter the two hardest words in the English language. I'm wrong. The three hardest words in the English language. I am sorry. The four hardest words in the English language. Honey, you were right. <laughs> the five hardest words in the English language. I know I'm not perfect. The six hardest words in the English language. I think I need some help. You get the idea. This pride over and over again blocks access to the High and Holy One who dwells with those who are crushed and lowly in spirit. So I guess you and I are forever standing outside the fence, shuffling along the sidewalk, right? Wrong. Because in the book of Isaiah, he tells us about one who was totally and absolutely crushed. And in him, we have access. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. In an ironic twist, the crushed one used to dwell in the high and lofty place. But in the fullness of time, God sent him down. He came down through the galaxies, through the solar system, past the stars and the moon. And in the silence of a night, the warmth of a candle, the whisper of a baby, he became flesh to dwell among us. Because, as Isaiah 53 goes on to say, it was Yahweh's will to crush him. One night his disciples were fast asleep and the next moment they were fast afoot. They chose Barabbas over him. The soldiers wanted to have fun. Herod wanted a show. Pilate wanted out. Caiaphas wanted death. The executioners, they just wanted blood. The strategy was singular. Beat and whip him to within an inch of his life and then stop. And then they placed a wooden crossbeam on that bloody, cut up back. They made him carry it up a hill to the place of the skull. 
And there they nailed him to the wood, hung him up for all to see, totally and completely crushed by threats and thorns. But that's not where it ends. That's not where verse 15 ends in our text either. Because there it says that the High and Holy One wants to revive the spirit of the lowly and enlivens the heart of the crushed. And that is the game changer. God didn't just simply want to crush him. He wanted to enliven the heart of the crushed one. Yes, to raise him from the dead. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Raised him again for the dead. For you and for me. And so the crushed one rises from the dead. Vindicated for all that he had done for us there on the cross. Finally, we say, finally, through him, we have access. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, with confidence, with confidence, we can enter the most holy place through the blood of Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Through Jesus' blood, you can go to the most holy place of the most holy God who has the most holy name. Finally, you and I have access. We have the right connections with the right person at the right time to accomplish the right things for the glory and honor of our God. So why remain outside, alone, standing on that sorry sidewalk, acting as if you don't have access to the most powerful person in the world? Because you do. The curtain is torn. The sacrifice complete. Death is defeated. And paradise is restored forevermore. That's why Charlotte Elliott says in the hymn, Just As I Am, she writes, Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken every barrier down. Now to be thine, yea, thine alone. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Unlimited access. That's God's good and perfect gift for you, for me, for the nations. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand